Yes. Uh, good evening, everyone. Uh, I would like to extend a very warm welcome to everyone who has joined us for a second keynote session by Professor Steph Krabs. Uh, this session will be chaired by Professor Simi Malotra, head at the Department of English and the guiding star of the conference, and my colleague and also a co-organizer of this conference, Soumya, who is currently working as a PhD scholar at the Department of English, Jamia Millia Islamia. Uh, Soumya's area of research is trauma theory and specifically the representation of childhood trauma in contemporary Indian literature. Uh, I will be moderating this session and the repertoire for this session will be Ritika. Uh, the audience can post their questions in the chat box, and I would now like to hand over the virtual mic to Samia and request her to introduce us and speak to Samia. Thank you, Sana. Good evening and a very warm welcome to everybody for joining us. It is my greatest honor and privilege to introduce our invited keynote speaker this evening, Professor Steph Krabs. Professor Steph Krabs is a professor of English literature at Ghent University in Belgium where he directs the Cultural Memory Studies Initiative. His research interests lie in 20th century and contemporary literature and culture, memory and trauma studies, post-colonial theory, and eco-criticism and the environmental humanities. He is the author of Post-Colonial Witnessing, Trauma Out of Bounds, Palgrave Macmillan 2013, and Trauma and Ethics in the Novels of Graham Swift, No Shortcuts to Salvation, Sussex Academic Press 2005 a co-author of the new critical idiom volume Trauma by Rutledge 2020, and a co-editor of Memory Unbound, Tracing the Dynamics of Memory Studies, Bargainan 2017. He has also co-edited special issues of journals, uh, including American Imago, Studies in the Novel, and Criticism on topics such as ecological grief, climate change fiction, and transcultural Holocaust memory. Currently, he is working on a study of ecological mourning as a creative and transformative process. Professor Krass is the founding coordinator of the Mnemonics Network, an international collaborative initiative to provide research training in memory studies for doctoral students and a co-chair of the Transformation of the Environment Working Group of the EU-funded Slow Mo Memory Cost Action. This session is titled From the Shadows to the Spotlight. Global South Perspectives on Trauma and Memory. This talk will be followed by a question and answer session. This session is being recorded and at the same time is being live streamed for our audiences and subscribers on YouTube. Thank you so much again, Professor Steph Krabs, for agreeing to be a part of this conference. And the floor is now yours, sir. Thank you so much, uh, Somia, uh, for that. <laughs> Uh, generous introduction and good evening everyone or um, good afternoon or good morning depending on where you are in the world um, let me start by sharing my screen there we go i hope you can all see my slides so i want to start by uh, thanking simi somia and the other organizers, um, Sana, Sango, and Farana, for inviting me to participate in this exciting conference and for accommodating my schedule. It's a great pleasure and an honor to have the opportunity to discuss my work uh, with you all. Some of you may have come across um, my book, post Coronal Witnessing, Trauma Out of Bounds, which was cited in the call for papers for this conference along with a few other publications of mine that came out uh, 10 to 15 years ago, it is widely credited with helping spearhead the trend towards pluralization, diversification, and inclusivity that characterizes much current literary and cultural trauma scholarship. In this lecture, I will use the benefits of a decade's hindsight to take a step back and situate the book within the field of memory and trauma studies, expand on the arguments I put forward there, and discuss what I see as some relevant recent developments. I will start by telling the story of how I came to write the book. I started my PhD at KU Leuven here in Belgium in the late 1990s. It's my PhD supervisor, Orto de Graaf, who first pointed me in the direction of trauma theory. Orto had played an important role in effecting 
the ethical turn in post-structuralism. As a PhD student himself, he had discovered the anti-Semitic wartime writings of the literary theorist Paul de Man in the mid-1980s. De Man, another Belgian, was the leading proponent of the so-called Yale School of Deconstruction, who had then recently passed away. He was a highly respected and admired literary scholar. When it was revealed that he had or had had anti-Semitic sympathies, this was a real bombshell that shook not just the discipline of literary studies, but the humanities and um, even the world beyond academia. It was literally front page news in the New York Times, which broke the news on the 1st of December, 1987. The reason this discovery was such a big deal is that it was seen as evidence by some critics that deconstruction was a morally dubious critical practice. Deconstruction and post-structuralism were seen as guilty by association. They weren't just indifferent or oblivious to reality, it was claimed, but actually immoral. The De Man Affair contributed to or hastened a paradigm shift in literary studies that was already underway from textualism to historicism. Trauma theory, as developed by Kathy Carruth, Shoshana Fellman and Jeffrey Hartman, can be seen as a response to this shift. It's an embattled paradigm, textualism, striking back as it were, reinventing itself in an ethical guise, asserting its relevance to history, politics, and ethics. Trauma theory claimed that a textualist approach is essential to gain access to history, and particularly a traumatic history like the Holocaust. Moreover, it allegedly has the potential to do good in the world. In addition to making an epistemological claim, trauma theory is also charged with ethical significance. It purports to be able to change the world for the better by promoting transcultural solidarity. After all, trauma is seen to act as a bridge between cultures. By fostering attunement to the suffering of others, trauma theory can allegedly help create new forms of community and solidarity. So trauma theory was effectively a product of the ethical turn affecting the humanities in the 1990s. It's no surprise that my PhD supervisor, who has a solid background in deconstruction himself and who felt very frustrated about the vicious and baseless attacks on this paradigm that his own PhD research had unleashed, it's no surprise, it's no surprise that he took an interest in trauma theory. He passed that interest on to me. However, I did not write my PhD thesis on trauma theory as such. It focused on the work of a contemporary British author, Graham Swift, whose novels I read through the lens of trauma theory, which was slightly unusual as the focus in trauma theory was mostly on the Holocaust at the time. And that's not what Swift writes about. Swift's novels tell the stories of individual characters who are struggling to come to terms with a traumatic individual and collective past. They are typically elderly English men who feel the foundation slipping away on which they and the communities to which they belong had built their entire existence. They are in denial about acting out or in some cases working through the trauma, the crisis of meaning that they are experiencing. I read these stories as explorations of what Paul Gilroy would later call post-colonial melancholy. So I finished my PhD in 2003. Gilroy published his book on this topic uh, one year later. That book is called Post-Colonial Melancholia, at least in the US, um, after Empire in the UK. Post-colonial melancholia is Gilroy's name for the inability of a former colonial power like the, the UK to face up to the legacies of its colonial past, which accounts for racism and xenophobia in the present. So I read Swift's novels as national allegories of a sort, with the stories about individual characters standing for the cultural pathologies of an entire nation, contemporary Britain. These pathologies have only got worse in recent years. Just think of Brexit. The fact that Swift's work spoke to me 
may have had something to do with the fact that as a Belgian citizen, I could easily relate to the condition he describes. After all, Belgium is a former colonial power, just like Britain, and it has also been in denial about its colonial past uh, for a very long time. In any case, this is what my PhD thesis was about, and that thesis became my first book. Upon finishing my PhD, I was hired at Ghent University as an expert on post-colonial literature. That was the profile that they were looking for. I had argued in my job interview that just because Graham Swift is a white British writer doesn't mean his work isn't post-colonial. Even so, having landed the job, I felt I ought to do more to live up to my title. I decided to continue the investigation of intersections of trauma studies and post-colonial studies that I had effectively started during my PhD. It occurred to me that there had been surprisingly little interaction between these two fields, despite their shared concerns. Both fields study processes of coming to terms with violent legacies. However, trauma scholars rarely discussed colonial or post-colonial realities. Conversely, post-colonial critics rarely drew on trauma theory in their work. I took it upon myself to try to bring the two fields into conversation. Together with my Ghent colleague, Pierre Bulens, I guess, edited a special double issue of studies in the novel devoted to post-colonial trauma novels. Michael Rothberg contributed an afterword to that collection, which was also cited in the call for papers for this conference. That was our very first collaboration back in 2008. A couple of years later, this collection was followed by my book, Post-Colonial Witnessing, in that book, I combined a theoretical argument with literary case studies from across the English-speaking world. These include literary texts by Indian, British Caribbean, and South African writers, Anita Desai, Carol Phillips, Fred Degar, David Abidine, and Sindhiwe Magona. Later on, I also published articles on book or book chapters in the same spirit about West African and Native American writers like Aminata Forna and Sherman Alexi. Postcolonial witnessing took its place among a wave of books, special journal issues and articles that reflected a certain unease about trauma studies becoming a field, a concern that a set of valuable and complex ideas and insights were congealing into a rigid methods or creed and thereby losing the capacity for self-reflection and the original investigative or ethical impulse. If trauma studies had seemed to be stagnating somewhat since its early burst of creative energy in the 1990s, my book, like these other publications, and I've listed some notable volumes on the slide, could be seen as an attempt to rethink and revitalize the field in order to ensure its enduring relevance in the globalized world of the 21st century. I tend to think of it as marking a shift from a celebratory moment in trauma studies to a more critical and reflexive one. In fact, it seems to me that such a shift has emerged in memory studies more generally over the last 15 years or so. Trauma studies can be viewed as something of a subfield of memory studies, even though it has a rather different institutional and conceptual history, and even though it is sometimes perceived as dominating the field of memory studies as a whole. Indeed, the initial euphoria and optimism characterizing much work on memory as a transcultural, transnational, or global phenomenon that had been done since the turn of the 21st century has dampened. It has been exposed as premature, naive, or unwarranted. Memory scholars these days are more likely to draw attention to factors that impede the mobility and flows of memory. Points of resistance to hegemonic homogenizing dynamics. Memory's role in border making as opposed to border crossing. I discussed this evolution from celebration to critique in a 2019 article in the journal called Mémoire en jeu, Memories at Stake. You can find it on my website in case you're interested. That's www.stefkerps.com. Much of the criticism that has been leveled at trauma studies in particular 
revolves around the prevalence of a Eurocentric perspective, which sits uneasily with the theory's globalizing thrust and its self-proclaimed ethical aspirations. As Kathy Carruth, one of the founding figures of trauma studies, has famously suggested, trauma itself may provide the very link between cultures. With trauma forming a bridge between disparate historical experiences, so the argument goes, trauma studies can contribute to the promotion of solidarity and the creation of new forms of community. As I and others have pointed out, however, this project is jeopardized by trauma studies' tendency to forget its situatedness and to assume universal validity for what are in fact local definitions and models. The impetus for much of the current theorization about trauma and representation was provided by the Nazi genocide of the European Jews. As is apparent from the work of Carruth, Shoshana Feldman and Dori Laub, Jeffrey Hartman and Dominic Lecapra, trauma studies as a field of cultural scholarship developed out of an engagement with Holocaust testimony, literature and history. It has primarily been produced in Europe and the United States, and despite its universalist pretensions, is profoundly marked by the specific context in which it originated. For one thing, despite the omnipresence of violence and suffering in the world, most attention within trauma studies has been devoted to events that took place in Europe or the US, most prominently the Holocaust and more recently 9-11. The focus, in other words, has tended to be quite narrow. Moreover, to the extent that trauma studies has ventured beyond these key Western trauma sites, it has generally failed to acknowledge the traumas of non-Western and minority populations on their own terms. Today, the concept of trauma is widely used to describe responses to extreme events across space and time, as well as to guide their treatment. However, as Alan Young reminds us in The Harmony of Illusions, Inventing Post-Traumatic Stress Disorder, it is actually a Western artifact invented in the late 19th century. The origins of this historical product can be located in a variety of medical and psychological discourses dealing with Euro-American experiences of industrialization, gender relations and modern warfare. The far-reaching implications of the fact that trauma is rooted in a particular historical and geographical context have long been ignored by academic researchers. They have tended to take for granted hegemonic definitions of trauma that are not scientifically neutral, but culturally specific, and which will have to be revised and modified if they are to adequately account for the psychological pain inflicted on members of non-Western and minority groups instead of compounding it. Indeed, it can be argued that the uncritical cross-cultural application of psychological concepts originating in the West amounts to a form of cultural imperialism. This claim has been made most forcefully by Derek Summerfield, a psychiatrist who sharply criticizes humanitarian interventions to provide psychological assistance in international conflict situations. As I argue in my book, rather than promoting cross-cultural solidarity, trauma studies risks assisting in the perpetuation of the very beliefs, practices and structures that maintain existing injustices and inequalities if it refuses to broaden its usual focus and continues to take for granted the universal validity of definitions of trauma and recovery that have developed out of the history of Western modernity. It doesn't help either for it to adhere to a prescriptive trauma aesthetic revolving around fragmentation and aporia that favours a narrow set of trauma texts by mostly Western writers and artists and effectively condemns alternative modes of bearing witness to trauma to oblivion or irrelevance. I will illustrate the arguments I have developed so far by briefly discussing a short poem by the Jamaican-American poet Claudia Rankine which seems to me to call for a more inclusive, pluralistic and politicized form of trauma studies. The poem is from Citizen, a collection published in 2014 that examines the experience of racism in the US and the West more generally through vignettes of everyday discrimination and prejudice and meditations on the violence, whether linguistic or physical, that has impacted the lives of numerous racially marked subjects. <laughs> 
The poem in question captures and denounces the mental health profession's traditional blindness to the psychic suffering of people of color. Let me read it for you. The new therapist specializes in trauma counseling. You have only ever spoken on the phone. Her house has a side gate that leads to a back entrance she uses for patients. You walk down a path bordered on both sides with deer grass and rosemary to the gate, which turns out to be locked. At the front door, the bell is a small round disc that you press firmly. When the door finally opens, the woman standing there yells at the top of her lungs, get away from my house. What are you doing in my yard? It's as if a wounded Doberman Pinscher or a German Shepherd has gained the power of speech. And though you back up a few steps, you manage to tell her you have an appointment. You have an appointment, she spits back. Then she pauses. Everything pauses. Oh, she says, followed by, oh yes, that's right. I am sorry. I am so sorry, so, so sorry. The poem recounts the first encounter between a trauma therapist and a patient addressed in the second person who unexpectedly turns up on her front doorstep after finding the side gate locked that leads to the back entrance which a therapist normally uses for patients. Having only spoken with him on the phone before, the therapist evidently assumed her new patient to be white, but he turns out to be black. In fact, she does not immediately recognize him as her patient, but sees him as an intruder and a trespasser. She reacts in anger and fear, yelling at him to leave the premises. It is not until the unwelcome guest manages to tell her that they actually have an appointment that it dawns on her that this is in fact her new patient. On realizing her mistake, she apologizes profusely. This anecdote reads like an allegory of the insensitivity to racial and cultural difference characteristic of canonical trauma studies, an attitude that, it is implied, generates further trauma. After all, the black man on the receiving end of the trauma counselor's rage is made to suffer a microaggression in being verbally assaulted and treated like scum. And such experiences can foster traumatic responses as they accrue over time. By blurring the boundaries between protagonist and reader, the use of second person narration enjoins the latter to sympathize with the former, making them feel his pain vicariously. Rankine's poem thus powerfully bears witness to the psychic suffering of an othered individual, which a dominant trauma paradigm ignores, marginalizes, or misconstrues. It does so, moreover, moreover without resorting to the kind of avant-garde experimentation or modernist pyrotechnics beloved of many trauma theorists. Indeed, Rankine's poetic language is unadorned, plain, direct, conversational prose. A thinker from an earlier generation who had a major influence on me and who should not go unmentioned is the revolutionary Martinican psychiatrist Franz Fanon. Fanon's pioneering work on the psychological effects of racism and colonialism from the 1950s and 60s helped me conceptualize a model of trauma that is more capacious than the traditional individual and event-based model, a model that can account for and respond to collective ongoing everyday forms of traumatizing violence. Fanon anticipated the criticisms of the individualizing, psychologizing, pathologizing, and depoliticizing tendencies of the dominant trauma model that I and others were formulating 10 to 15 years ago. His work confirmed to me that I really was onto something, that it did in fact make a whole lot of sense to try to bring trauma studies and postcolonial studies into closer contact. However, people did not tend to read Fanon as a trauma theorist. He wasn't recognized as such, which is why I felt it was important to hail him as a pioneer of post-colonial trauma theory in my book, as Rebecca Saunders had already started doing. Black Skin, White Masks contains a very famous and very memorable description of what we would call a microaggression these days. Fanon describes the devastating impact on his sense of himself of encountering racial fear in a white child in France. 
It's not just spectacular, extraordinary, catastrophic events that can cause trauma. Trauma can also result from an accumulation of such small, everyday humiliations, slights, insults, and indignities. Fanon also emphasizes the social nature of the traumas caused by racism and colonialism. It doesn't make sense to treat them as individual problems, as psychoanalysis tended and tends to do. Moreover, he insisted on the need for material liberation. In and of itself, the talking cure doesn't suffice for Fanon. Healing or recovery from racial or colonial trauma won't come from verbalizing one's traumatic experiences. The political and socioeconomic conditions that cause the trauma also have to be transformed for there to be genuine healing or recovery. Fanon even anticipated contemporary research on perpetrated trauma. In the final chapter of The Wretched of the Earth, colonial war and mental disorders. He writes about treating not just Algerian torture victims at his psychiatric clinic during the Algerian War of Liberation, but also their French torturers. Like the victims, they experienced mental distress, in their case, from inflicting suffering on others instead of from undergoing it themselves. Besides broadening the focus of trauma studies to encompass traumatic experiences of non-Western and minority groups and revising and expanding hegemonic definitions of trauma accordingly, scholars working to liberate the field of its persistent Eurocentric monocultural tendencies have also begun to draw attention to the interrelations between traumatic metropolitan or first world histories, particularly the Holocaust, and traumatic colonial histories. In so doing, they, or rather we, call into question notions of absolute uniqueness and radical incomparability that had led to Western historical traumas typically being considered in isolation from, and often at the expense of, other historical tragedies. As we've seen, an insistence on the inherent relationality of trauma can already be found in Carruth's field-defining publications from the mid-1990s. Even so, the founding texts of literary trauma studies, including Carruth's own work, are largely focused on a single historical trauma and rarely venture beyond the boundaries of Europe and the US. It fell to later trauma theorists and critics to forge the kinds of links among traumatic histories hinted at, but not pursued at any great length by Carruth, nor by Feldman and Laub, Hartmann or Le Capra. Over the last 15 years, a significant amount of literary scholarship has been devoted to the interrelatedness of memories of the Holocaust and other atrocities, which have in fact already engaged the attention of historians, philosophers, and sociologists and other uh, intellectuals since soon after the end of the Second World War. One thinks, for example, of M. A. Césaire's Discourse on Colonialism, Hannah Arendt's The Origins of Totalitarianism, Paul Gilroy's The Black Atlantic and Between Camps, and the work of historians of comparative genocide, such as Dirk Moses and Dan Stone. Noteworthy works of literary scholarship on comparative trauma include Brian Chayette's The Aspers of the Mind, Deberati Sanyal's Memory and Complicity, Max Silverman's Palimpsestic Memory, and Michael Rothberg's multidirectional memory, with the latter proving particularly influential. While the comparative approach undoubtedly represents one of the most important and necessary innovations in trauma studies, a caveat has to be made. Somewhat paradoxically, the Holocaust remains central to many efforts to decentralize Western historical traumas. All the studies I've mentioned, including my own, take the Nazi genocide as their point of comparison, as does a lot of other scholarship in this area. As a result, our collective efforts to move beyond the logic of the unique, the incomparable, and the unprecedented, which has tended to keep the focus squarely on a genocide committed in Europe by Europeans against other Europeans, may inadvertently prove counterproductive. After all, there is something paradoxical about considering one particular history to be uniquely suited to challenging the uniqueness paradigm. There is still a need for more comparative work in trauma studies, but 
it would be salutary, it seems to me, if a greater variety of histories were brought into contact with one another. And I was pleased to see that scholars such as Jay Rajiva, Jennifer Yusin, and Sakiro Adibayo are doing just that. You see their monographs on the slide along with uh, three equally interesting edited collections with a similar mission. They all engage in cross-regional comparative work involving literatures from Asia, Africa, and beyond without constantly circling back to the Holocaust. I think it is fair to say that over the last 15 years or so, trauma scholarship in the humanities has become a lot more clear-eyed about the limitations and exclusions of trauma studies as conceived by Carruth and others in the early to mid-1990s. In fact, in the afterword to the 20th anniversary edition of her influential book, Unclaimed Experience, which came out in 2016, Caruth herself at last acknowledges the post-colonial critique of classical trauma studies. Her engagement with it, however, strikes me as unduly and unhelpfully defensive, limited and dismissive. She makes it appear as if everything turns on her critics' alleged failure to appreciate the full complexity of the story of Tancred and Corinda, an episode from Torquato Tasso's epic poem Jerusalem Delivered, which she goes on to analyze in much greater detail than she had done previously for the best part of the afterword. Her reading is very sophisticated, but I don't really see how it supposedly invalidates or refutes all the objections people have raised to her work. That appears to be the goal though, and um, or the goal rather that this close reading is, is meant to achieve. The fact that trauma scholarship has entered its post-celebratory phase does not mean that it has become a cynical undertaking. Trauma studies has not abandoned its progressive commitments and lapsed into political quietism and despairing resignation. After all, critique is not a strictly negative endeavor, but a crucial step in seeing more clearly, understanding more deeply, and consequently acting more responsibly. Speaking for myself, I conclude my book by arguing that a revised, inclusive, culturally sensitive trauma studies can help identify and understand situations of exploitation and abuse and act as an incentive for a sustained and systemic critique of societal conditions. By fostering attunement to previously unheard suffering and putting into global circulation memories of a broad range of traumatic histories, a more reflexive, pluralistic and flexible trauma studies can assist in raising awareness of injustice, both past and present, and opening up the possibility of a more just global future. In so doing, it would actually deliver on the ethical promise of the field rather than giving up on it. My sense is that 10 to 15 years ago, we were only at the beginning of this process. That's definitely where I would situate, situ situate my own work in this area. What I did in post colonial witnessing was diagnose a problem, but not so much remedy it. To some extent, I think this was symptomatic of the phase we were in. I tended to focus on literary texts that highlight the shortcomings of the dominant trauma discourse. For example, Sindhibi Magona's novel, Mother to Mother, and Aminata Fauna's novel, The Memory of Love. These are texts by post-colonial writers who, however, are steeped in Western culture, who write in English, and who address a Western audience first and foremost. I think this is true for Rankine and Alexi as well. They invest considerable energy in pointing out the inappropriateness and the injustice of applying Western frameworks to a, co a colonial or post-colonial situation, but they are less concerned with offering a concrete alternative. That is the next step, I think. Once the critique is out of the way, we can start examining what an alternative to the dominant trauma discourse might look like in practice, on the ground, in particular non-Western or minority contexts. It's been very gratifying to see that my work has been taken up by other scholars who are doing just that. And I'm thinking, for example, of the work of Ryan Topper, Caroline Williamson Sinalo, Jay Rajiva, Jennifer Yusin, and Sakiro Adebayo, as well as the contribut contributors to the edited collections that I referred to earlier. 
They are studying how the cultural production of particular non-Western or minority groups bears witness to painful histories. This requires specialized knowledge of these other cultures and languages, of the different media and forms of expression they use, and of local beliefs about suffering and healing. It seems to me that this is where postcoronal trauma studies has been headed since I made my most notable contribution to it in the form of my book, Postcolonial Witnessing. Another promising development that I see is the exploration of intersections between memory and trauma studies and the environmental humanities. That's the direction in which my own research has been moving over the last 10 years. I'm not alone, of course, in turning my attention to the climate and ecological crisis in my work. There has recently been a surge of interest in environmental issues among memory and trauma scholars, which is unsurprising, perhaps, as our dire environmental predicament continues to deteriorate and hence is becoming harder and harder to ignore. However, for a long time, that is exactly what happened, or so it seems to me. In a recent essay on climate trauma, I critiqued trauma theory's persistent anthropocentrism, the fact that it remains wedded to the idea that trauma is an essentially human experience. The trauma theory has tended the trauma theory has tended to espouse an anthropocentric worldview can be illustrated with reference to, once again, the story of Tancred and Corinda. As I've already mentioned, that's an episode from Torquato Tasso's 16th century epic poem, Jerusalem Delivered. Its interpretations by Sigmund Freud and Kathy Carruth have attracted considerable interest within the field of humanistic trauma scholarship. In fact, the story of Tancred and Clorinda has become a focal point for the articulation of trauma theory, as well as for critiques that have been leveled against it. In Beyond the Pleasure Principle, Freud describes the story as follows. Its hero, Tancred, unwittingly kills his beloved Clorinda in a duel while she's disguised in the armor of an enemy knight. After her burial, he makes his way into a strange magic forest, which strikes the crusader's army with terror. He slashes with his sword at a tall tree, but blood streams from the cut, and the voice of Clorinda, whose soul is imprisoned in the tree, is heard complaining that he has wounded his beloved once again. Freud interprets Tancred's unknowing wounding of his beloved, not just once but twice, as an example of the repetition compulsion inherent in trauma. Caruth, for her part, draws attention to, quote, the moving and sorrowful voice that cries out, a voice that is paradoxically released through the wound. For Caruth, Tancred's story represents traumatic experience as, quote, the enigma of the otherness of a human voice that cries out from the wound. Many critics, myself included, have expressed reservations about the ways in which Caruth's analysis shifts the focus from the Ethiopian princess Clorinda's wound to the white European crusader Tancred's suffering, mostly to do with perceived Eurocentric bias and the blurring of boundaries between perpetrator and victim. However, another aspect of this story and its interpretations by Freud and Carruth that has not yet been remarked upon is the anthropocentrism that underlies and unites these various accounts. Indeed, what Tasso's text and Freud's and Carruth's readings of it, as well as the critiques leveled at Carruth, have in common is the interpretation of harm to the natural world, a cut in a tree, in terms of violence and trauma inflicted on and suffered by humans, Clorinda and Tancred. The poem and its various readers are quick to trope away from environmental destruction. They turn it into an image for human suffering. In so doing, they derealize and invisibilize a scene of literal damage to a tree. I'm interested in attempts that are currently being made to reconceptualize trauma in non-anthropocentric terms and to acknowledge the interconnectedness and entanglement of human and more than human or non-human traumas. Concepts such as eco-trauma or geo-trauma that have recently been developed signal 
a new materialist or post-humanist turn in trauma studies, which rethinks trauma from a broader conception of life or even inanimate matter and challenges the field to move beyond human exceptionalism and exemptionalism. It makes a lot of sense, it seems to me, to try to connect patterns of social and environmental violence, which often go hand in hand in this way. This point has been made very eloquently and persuasively by the Indian novelist Amitav Ghosh. In his nonfiction book, The Nutmeg's Curse, Parables for a Planet in Crisis, Ghosh reconceives modernity as a centuries-long campaign of omnicide. The hegemonic global powers have treated the planet, including its plants, animals, and non-white peoples, as an object to be subjugated and devoured, mute and deprived of agency available for the taking and killing. According to Ghosh, at the heart of the vision of world as resource lies an unrestrainable excess that leads ultimately not just to genocide, but an even greater violence, an impulse that can only be called omnicide, the desire to destroy everything, quote unquote. So omnicide encompasses genocide and ecocide. The antidote Ghosh prescribes for the urge to omnicide that he sees as inherent in Western geopolitical dominance is the rehabilitation of the very non-mechanistic and vitalist modes of thought Western culture has pushed to the margins. He urgently calls for the restoration of agency and voice to non-humans and the adoption of a new global politics of vitality when we tell ourselves stories about the planet and our relationship with it. The fate of humans and all our relatives depends on it, he writes. It seems to me that the environmental turn in memory and trauma studies could help raise awareness about and help prevent or redress omnicide. In conclusion, as we reflect on the trajectory of memory and trauma studies over the past decade and a half, it becomes evident that the field has undergone a transformative journey from a Eurocentric perspective to a more responsibly global, if not planetary one. My book, Postcolonial Witnessing, played a role in challenging the narrow focus of trauma theory and advocating for a broader, more inclusive approach that considers the experiences of non-Western and minority populations. However, it is clear that the journey is far from over. Apart from critiquing the dominant trauma discourse, we need to actively seek alternative frameworks, especially in non-Western and minority contexts, and explore how the cultural production, in particular Global South settings, bears witness to a variety of painful histories. Moreover, the intersection of memory and trauma studies, on the one hand, with the environmental humanities, on the other, marks a promising direction for future research, it seems to me, addressing the urgent need to confront issues of ecological crisis and omnicide. As we continue to navigate the complexities of trauma and memory, it is imperative that our scholarly endeavors contribute to a more inclusive, culturally sensitive and globally aware understanding of the human and more than human experience. I'll leave it there. So thank you for your attention and uh, I look forward to your questions and comments. And with that, I'll stop sharing my screen. Thank you so much, Professor Steph Krabs. Thank you for that very comprehensive speech. You have highlighted very important points about the paradigm shift in trauma studies, the ethical turn that is, and about insidious trauma when you talk about Fanon and also the linkages between ecological grief and um, trauma, focusing on the keyword omnicide. And of course, the four concerns that you raise in your very important work, witness uh, post-colonial witnessing, continues to be relevant uh, about your critique of the marginalization of uh, minority cultures, about the universal definition of trauma and recovery, your critique of the normative uh, aesthetics of trauma and also the relation between first and third world trauma. Thank you also for giving us such a huge compendium of research, resources to look into and uh, for giving us so much to think about. And now I would like to pass on the virtual mic to my colleague Sana, who is the moderator of the session.
Um, thank you so much, Soumya, and thank you so much, uh, Professor Krabs, for that extremely uh, lucid and enriching talk. And uh, I would uh, not like to waste any more time. Uh, I would directly go to the questions. I think we have Professor Nishat Heather with us. I would ask you to unmute Professor Heather, and you can ask your question. Um, thank you very much, Professor Krabs, for your um, this very thought-provoking talk. And... Um, uh, yes, um, we all do agree that um, there is, in fact, uh, no need to compare every other traumatic event uh, uh, to the wars in Europe and to Holocaust. And we should, in fact, really look at um, the, the specificities, uh, the temporal uh, uh, specificities, uh, the spatial specificities, and um, in the, uh, instead examine events on their own terms. But um, and 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 uh, and this question is um, uh, particularly um, uh, particularly with respect to your work, uh, post-colonial witnessing, which we have, uh, you know, uh, which is uh, a very very important and seminal work, and in which you have looked at the experiences of writers from South Africa, Guyana, and India, and Saint Kate, and so on. But how would you respond to your critics that uh, even though you have looked at literary experiences or let's say uh, experiences of writers from uh, these very diverse regions, but you have deliberately or otherwise kind of ignored um, uh, uh, much of the work that have been done by uh, contemporary uh, critics of uh, or, 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 or theorists of trauma studies and trauma theory, uh, like Dinah Taylor, uh, like uh, Idelbert um, Avilar, and even uh, Kathy Karut's uh, uh, more recent work that she has done on, uh, uh, on, 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 um, uh, on democracy in Chile. So how would you respond to that? Thank you so much um, for the question. Let me first of all say that I, I am not, or I, I didn't want to create the impression that I'm sort of against doing uh, comparative work uh, as such, right? Um, so the the gist of my uh, sort of critique of um, of the kind of comparative work that has often been done um, in trauma studies is that it's even though it ostensibly seeks to decenter. Uh, these Western historical traumas in practice, if you're always going to compare another historical tragedy to the Holocaust, you're still paradoxically uh, centralizing the Holocaust, right? So centering the Holocaust. So in that sense, uh, that is sort of, uh, I actually call for more uh, comparative, sort of cross-regional comparative work, but without constantly necessarily circling back to that um, point of reference, right? So um uh, I think I was basically calling for a more thorough, um, uh, you know, decentering, I guess, um, uh, there. But um, as for your question, you know, uh, indeed, I in this book I look at a number of writers engaged with um, uh, the the scholarship that I was aware of at the time. Um, it, you know, it was just one book. Uh, I have often, you know, when I gave talks about my work uh, in Eastern Europe, for example, uh, or in other parts of the world, people would sometimes um, react saying, well, why didn't you say anything about Eastern Europe, right? Or, or about uh, legacies of, of communism and so on and so forth. Isn't there sort of a post colonial dimension to that? Isn't that relevant as well? Um, and I would say absolutely, um, but I am not an expert in in everything, right? There are limits to my expertise. Um, so I, I did select a number of case studies from um, around the English speaking world that I felt reasonably confident about, uh, that I thought I have something to say about and that I um, you know, somewhat knowledgeable about at least, right? But I wouldn't uh, dare to you know, um, present myself as an expert on, uh, say, I don't know, Latin American literature or culture uh, or Eastern European uh, for that matter. So I, I guess there are limits to my expertise, right, which sort of made me hesitant. Uh, actually, what, what I'm sort of calling for is, um, is exactly the kind of work that would, um, um, you know, the kind of scholarship that would actually be um, um, 
fully not knowledgeable about particular contexts for them to to look at the cultural production of certain you know global south settings um and do that kind of work so i i like to believe that my my work and my, my book in particular sort of opened up a space uh for that by saying this is what we need but i didn't feel like it was my well responsibility or at least it, it was my uh, or it was even possible for me or any one individual scholar i suppose to actually um heed that call that i made um, in the book and i'm sure there were oversights in terms of the theoretical framework you know i did sort of what i what i could but i'm sure uh, there is work that that is highly relevant that i was simply not aware of um, and that maybe I, I could and should have engaged with. Um, so, so absolutely, there was no, you know, deliberate um, intention to ignore or, or you know, uh, or somehow uh, repress uh, scholarship of, of particular colleagues. Um, I mean, speaking of Diana Taylor, uh, definitely. I mean, I, I actually uh, audited a graduate course that she co-taught with um, Mariana Hirsch a couple of years before the book came out. So I was definitely, you know, aware of uh, her work and, and a great admirer of it. Um, I, I guess, you know, I mean, she, but she obviously mostly writes about Latin American uh, context, which is not my area of expertise at all, right? So I guess that's sort of one reason why it did not immediately occur to me to, to sort of uh, bring her work into the conversation. Thank you. Thank yeah. you so much, Professor Krabs. Uh, we have another question from uh, Professor Borzaga, who will uh, be listening to tomorrow. Uh, but right now, uh, she has a question for you. Professor Borzaga, if you can unmute yourself. Hello, can you hear me? Yes. 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 Uh, hello. Uh, good afternoon from Utrecht. Uh, thank you, Steph, for the impressive talk and uh, overview. Um, and today in the keynotes, both in your keynote and also Roger Lackett's keynote, uh, we heard a lot about theory and uh, Eurocentric conceptualizations of trauma. Um, and I totally agree with you that Fanon was an incredible pioneer of trauma theory. Um, I wanted to ask you if you could elaborate a bit more because we haven't heard too much about uh, literature, literariness, aesthetics, or in general literature so far, uh, whether you could elaborate a little bit more uh, on your experience of reading uh, the text in post-colonial witnessing and what were do you think the aesthetic, narratological, uh, imaginative uh, tools that made you really rethink uh, um, the concept of trauma and how did that experience differ from reading uh, other uh, traumatic uh, trauma narratives, Western trauma narratives. And what I guess I'm trying to say is that um, we are not just trying to impose a certain um, concept of trauma, but Caruth also suggested in a way, a way of approaching reading and uh, reading trauma narratives. Uh, so what do you think would have gone lost by applying that kind of approach? And um, um, yeah, I don't know whether my, my question is clear, but it's more about aesthetics and also the experience with this text. Um, Okay, thank you. And good to see you here, uh, Michaela. I, I can't actually see you uh, on the screen. And I was sorry to miss Roger's uh, talk earlier today, but I'm, I'm in the middle uh, of an examination period, um, unfortunately, so things are rather hectic over here. Um, but thanks for the question about aesthetics. Uh, that's something that I, I have indeed um, sort of hinted at, I guess, in my talk today, but it's definitely um, something that's important to me and that I deal with i think it's at somewhat greater length in in the book uh, and elsewhere as well um if you look at literary trauma scholarship from the mid 1990s what you find i think is that there is something of a consensus that um the best way to for literature to bear witness to traumatic histories and experiences is through um, modernist or post postmodern um, modes of representation, um, like you know nonlinearity, fragmentation, aporia, uh, and so on and, and so forth. So through avant-garde um, experimentation, really, um, that's sort of um, the the way to go. Uh, like you know, the, the idea being that there is a kind of parallel between the experience of trauma, which 
defies understanding and these experimental modes of representation, which um, sort of um, um, sort of defy um, you know normal understanding as well. So there is sort of a, 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 an, an obvious match in a way between the breakdown of language and uh, sort of the, the 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 breakdown of meaning um, in the experience of of trauma, um, which sort of makes intuitive sense. But as I started reading more and more. Um, post-colonial trauma literature, I was struck by the fact that um, a lot of it did not really conform to that particular aesthetic, um, that much of it, you know, um, was sort of realist in nature or um, sort of adhered to um, aesthetic norms or aesthetic traditions that do not really or cannot really be considered to fall under that rubric of modernism or postmodernism. And so it, it occurred to me that, in fact, this aesthetic, and it, it's really, you know, prescribed as such, but it's sort of taken for granted. There's something prescriptive about it, uh, something normative about it. If you sort of read um, the work from these 1990s trauma theorists uh, there is sort of an assumption that this is sort of the the way to go as it were and it occurred to me that that's actually a way of excluding um a lot of cultural production um not just from you know from elsewhere from the global south um, but also from um within you know europe the us the west um uh it's it, the focus is very much on sort of highbrow literary um fiction and um or other types of literature. And, and there is something exclusionary about this, which I found problematic. And I interpreted this as sort of yet another way in which uh, trauma or sort of literary trauma scholarship from the 1990s reflects um, a, um, a Eurocentric perspective, how there is something of a Eurocentric bias there. And um, so in, in the book, I called for... Um, I guess a more or, or less normative approach to trauma aesthetics, right? So I, 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 I think there's a need to sort of to go beyond trauma aesthetics uh, or the idea that there is one particular right way to um, bear witness to trauma through literature, um, because then you sort of risk ending up with a narrow trauma canon consisting mostly of works by uh, Western, you know, modernist and postmodern writers, which I think is problematic because uh, that way you're excluding a lot of important um, work that is happening elsewhere. Uh, again, so I, I'm not making an argument against, um, you know, um, avant-garde, um, experimental, modernist, postmodern writing, not at all, uh, but I'm just... Um, calling for more openness, more flexibility, pluralism, I suppose, when it comes to trauma aesthetics. Thank you. Thank Does that you. answer your question? Okay, thank you. <laughs> uh -huh, yeah. Thank you. Um, uh, let's go with the second question. Uh, there's a question from uh, Chitra. Chitra asks that uh, in the context of post-colonial discourses, how will you situate the trauma of people who've been displaced, but not because of the global events like wars or genocides, but where the displacement is caused by other rather smaller reasons or indirect and personal reasons? Mm -hmm. No, absolutely. Um, yeah, I mean, in, in my work on um, on climate change, uh, the work that I've sort of been doing for the last. Um, 10 years, I would say, so when I've sort of moved into the environmental humanities, um, you know, climate change and, and other forms of environmental degradation have been interpreted as forms of slow violence, um, which are not spectacular, um, sudden or unexpected, but they're sort of a, a gradual uh, deterioration, you might say. So it's, it's a long drawn out um, gradual process, which um, does have um, serious impacts obviously but you can't really um sort of pinpoint one major event or so i mean there, there are of course um extreme weather events but the overall process you know um is slow and gradual and uh, and unspectacular 
right? So, you know, gradual, gradually rising uh, global mean surface temperatures. Um, that, that, that's it. It's a very slow, gradual uh, process. And um, I I think, you know, it, it, it is definitely important to recognize uh, the impact that such um, processes can have. And I think that's sort of um, a more general trend in um, in memory and trauma scholarship. Uh, as uh, Somia mentioned in her introduction, I'm currently co-chairing um, a working group, the Transformation of the Environment Working Group, which is part of the EU-funded Slow Memory Cost Action, uh, chaired by Jenny Wustenberg, uh, which is actually all about that shift from memory studies focus on events to processes, which... Um, tended to, you know, stay under the radar of memory and trauma scholarship, but which are really impactful when you think about it, you know, uh, processes like, you know, neoliberal restructuring or indeed environmental degradation, um, which memory and trauma scholars have tended not to pay too much attention to because they've been too focused on wars and genocides and terrorism and so on and so forth, which are spectacular and sudden and, and you know, eventful. Um, and I think there is a, a shift um, which is sort of on, ongoing uh, towards paying greater attention to precisely these kinds of processes, which also have a major impact, but which have tended to be ignored. So, uh, so yeah, absolutely. That's something I'm, I'm definitely uh, aware of, interested in, and that I would like to see more work about um, in, in the years ahead. Uh, thank you, Professor Krabs. Uh, we are officially, the time is uh, uh, up, but uh, since this is the last session and the, we have so many questions pouring in, uh, if you would be so gracious, we could maybe uh, take a couple of more questions. Absolutely, it'd be a pleasure. Uh, so we have a question uh, from Sanjukta. She thanks you for the enlightening talk, so do all of us. And she asks, how does cultural remembrance and forgetting of trauma and memory in literature and language tend to get unfurled into more proliferated veracity or rather collect more profound intersectional significance? Uh, does temporality play a significant role in digging out the pluralist interventions in multiple and alternate histories, pushing the hegemonic uh, memory narratives at the background in favor of the comparative transcultural histories and narratives? Well, I think I'd have to reread that question actually I'm not sure I fully I fully understood um that question um uh, do I go uh, ahead no, Sana, with another you post you can post that question to professor Krabs. maybe if you just post it on the chat box you'd be able to okay. see it in front right. of it. yeah that might help it sounded quite uh, quite uh, dense yeah. uh, but really yeah. interesting uh, for that matter but um yes I'm just posting it in effect oh thank you <laughs> sorry about that It's there in your chat, so. Okay, thank you. Yeah, it's good to have it in front of me. Um... Hey. Um... So temporality playing a significant role in digging out pluralistic interventions in multiple and alternative histories, pushing the hegemonic memory narratives, uh, the background in favor of comparative transcultural histories and narratives. Um, uh, I, I'm, not, I'm not sure that that's um, what's happening. In, in my talk, I sort of highlighted uh, the need for comparative work, and I think um, you know, a fair amount has in fact come out in recent years. You know, I put some some covers of monographs and edited collections on the slides. Um, I think that's an exciting development. Um, I you know I hesitate to to say that this is now sort of the um, uh, the the new norm or uh, or that this is sort of um, you know everybody's doing this. Uh, I, I don't think so. You know, I think um, the, these hegemonic um, narratives that and uh, that the um you know that the questioner asked about i think they're still there right um but i um uh, i just wanted to draw attention to a tendency to um to to foreground um comparative 
cross-regional comparative work, it just occurred to me that there is a fair amount of that out there, um, which you didn't really see so much of um, until, say, 10, 15 years ago. It's sort of my impression. If, if you go back to the 1990s, I think trauma scholarship, though, it sort of gestured towards the transcultural, the transnational, um, uh, I think most trauma theorists and critics at the time tended to focus on the legacies of one particular historical tragedy. Um, I, I do think there is a trend. Uh, again, I, I can't quantify this or, or anything, but I do notice that there is a lot of comparative work uh, that has been coming out in, in recent years. Whether it's displaced um, sort of hegemonic um, narratives, I'm not sure, but it's um, a tendency that um, I've noticed and that I, I think is um, is very welcome. So I hope that answers the question to some extent. Um, perfect. Uh, sir, uh, another question uh, is that in exploring global South perspectives on trauma, how do you address power dynamics within academic discourses? And what role do you see for scholars from the global South in shaping and leading the trajectory of trauma theory? What was the last part of the question, uh, Sana? Would you mind repeating? Sure. Uh, what role do you see for scholars from the global south in shaping mm. and leading the trajectory of trauma theory? Yeah. Okay. Great question. Yes. Well, you know, I'm delighted that this conference is happening. Um, let me. Let me. I think this is this is wonderful um, and, and long overdue. I think. Um, um, so, you know, I, I think it's, and I think over the last couple of years, I, I try to, you know, highlight and, and foreground a number of collections by, that were actually edited um, by people from the Global South, um, uh, you know, from South Africa, from, from India. Um, I, I, I do think this is really, you know, critically important for people actually from the Global South to, to sort of um, take the lead here, right? And um you know, I'm very aware of my own situatedness as, um, you know, a white um, male European uh, who finds himself in a very privileged position um, in, in many ways um, and to be able to do this kind of, of work. And so, so sort of, I, I sort of understand that there are, you know, inequalities and imbalances uh, in the world and that there is something perhaps slightly you know, I don't know, ironic or uneasy that sort of the critique of um, Eurocentrism is coming from within, you know, Europe <laughs> itself, though, on the other hand, I think, you know, um, uh, why not? Or at least um, um, I, I like to believe that, um, you know, I, I have managed to to make some sort of valuable contribution. But indeed, um, I, I do think it would be wonderful if um, more scholars from the Global South sort of stepped up and uh, and sort of produced scholarship on um, memory and trauma in Global South settings. Absolutely. Um, I, I do feel, I often feel sort of uneasy, I guess, about um, the, um, um, the fact that it is often scholars from, you know, high income countries in the Global North um, who, um, who sort of um, do this kind of work? It shouldn't be, you know, it shouldn't exclusively be be up to us, um, I guess, right? So I'm, I'm I'm totally in favor, and and I I I, I very much welcome um, scholars from uh, from India, from South Africa, from from other parts of the world uh, in, in in global south, um, stepping up as it were, and uh, and and taking um, the uh, the, the, the baton of picking up um, where sort of we left off, absolutely. Thank you. Uh, sir, we have one more question, if you allow us to. Sure. Um, in examining trauma from Global South perspectives, how do you challenge or deconstruct Western-centric paradigms without inadvertently reinforcing a binary opposition between the Global South and the Global North? What strategies do you employ to foster a more nuanced and interconnected understanding of trauma across diverse cultural contexts. Mm -hmm. Okay, yeah, great question. Um, indeed, that is sort of something I'm I'm aware of, that sort of pitfall that it's easy to um, fall into, you know, the, um, uh, the tendency to um, oppose the West and the rest, right? Uh, the global North and the global South and to, to sort of... Um, 
you know, homogenize um, the global south or the global north, uh, which is clearly not what I set out um, to do, because I'm actually reacting against the tendency to homogenize trauma um, and see it as sort of one monolithic thing um, that is sort of the same all the time and everywhere, right? I mean, that's really very much what my, what, what the, um, the core of my critique is that we need to um, be more mindful of the situatedness of traumatic experiences and history and refrain from uh, assuming that there is a one size fits all model, um, um, so that there's a need for greater cultural sensitivity, for example, right? Um, so it would be kind of ironic if, um, you know, you, you, in, in making that case, you end up homogenizing uh, entire, you know, regions or parts of the world. That's very much not what I um, intend to do. And I hope, you know, I, I don't really um, fall into um, or, or make that mistake too often. But um, at the same time, it is sometimes difficult to avoid, you know, um, if you want to, to talk about um, global issues, um, and you, you do need to sort of strategically, I suppose, um, use these concepts of global south, the west. Um, they're kind of hard to avoid. But at the same time, I I think it is important, and I, I may have fallen short in this regard myself uh, on occasion, to try to be as nuanced and as um, you know respectful and 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 mindful of um, differences. Uh, I think it is important to try to um avoid sort of homogenizing um um entire regions and their experience right so it's it's definitely a caveat is something that i think we should all be be uh, aware of that this is something a risk that we run um but again the fact that it's a risk that exists does not mean you know that you, you you've got to sort of play it safe and um stop talking about um, these issues, right? I mean, that would sort of be an easy way out, I suppose. Um, but I um, I don't think that's, um, you know, the, the, the way to go either. Thank you. Thank you so much, Professor Krabs. Uh, you'll have to believe us that there are numerous number of questions <laughs> flowing in the chat box, and we'll have to ap we apologize to all of the people who wanted to ask Professor Krabs their questions, but uh, we've already taken 12 of his extra minutes. Uh, so I would just uh, like to stop with the questions now and would like to you know, thank you, Professor uh, Krabs, for this amazing, lucid, and such enlightening talk and taking your time from your, I'm, I'm sure you said that you had your exam sessions uh, on. So I'm sure uh, it was a task to take uh, some time out for us. So thank you very much for making that time for us. We couldn't have asked for a better end uh, to the first day of our conference. Um, thank you very much again. I would also uh, like this opportunity um, uh, to thank the chairs for this session, Professor Simi Malotra and Soumya, and also the repertoire, Ritika, and all the participants who have joined us from different time zones. Uh, we've had an amazing start uh, to our three-day-long conference, and we hope to reproduce uh, this brilliance for the next two days. Uh, please join us tomorrow at uh, 12 p.m. IST uh, for the day two. We have two more uh, speakers speaking, Professor Borzaga and uh, Professor Sam Duran. Uh, now, I would like to officially close uh, for the second, uh, for the first day, and uh, I'll be stopping the recording now. Thank you so much. Thank you so much, Professor Krabs. Really grateful, really grateful that you took out so much time for us. Thank you so much. So grateful. Oh, thank you so much for having me. It's been a total pleasure, and uh, congratulations again on you know putting this conference together. And I hope to be able to catch a few more sessions at least in the days ahead. Uh, thank you. Thanks thank for you. having me. Thank you. So grateful. Thank you.